Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Monday, July 29th, 2019. Let's start off the tour today looking at the sea surface temperature anomaly chart. This for the Western Hemisphere. You can see these instability waves. They literally look like little waves in the Eastern Pacific, now firmly chiseling their way into that Nino 3.4 area. And that is going to continue to bring down this overall pattern of ENSO dominated weather. Slowly but surely, El Nino Southern Oscillation, that pattern of a warmer Pacific tropical equatorial region coupled with the atmosphere is slowly changing. We've seen the changes in the sea surface temperatures here, the anomalies, even at the subsurface as well, of course and eventually that will translate into changes in the atmosphere and eventually that should impact the shear in the Caribbean and the far western portions of the tropical Atlantic here making things more favorable as we get into latter August and beyond. Typically El Nino does not affect the Gulf of Mexico very much as this is kind of its own isolated area as we saw last year with Category 5 Michael it's always warm enough to support intense hurricanes and very very rarely do uh, these El Nino or La Nina phenomenon La Nina the opposite of El Nino and we might be headed towards a La Nina we'll just have to see that's next year though um, but typically this doesn't affect the Gulf of Mexico it's kind of its own area uh, as is the subtropics of the Atlantic up here we're really focused on this area right through here the main development region through the Caribbean that changes in the equatorial Pacific can impact and I see and think that as we progress remember it's only the end of July right now we still have about a month to go a little less than a month before the climatological peak of the hurricane season gets here and with the loss of that El Nino it could be an active time ahead and we're starting to see some signs of that already most of the tropical Atlantic right where it should be maybe slightly above the long-term average subtropical Atlantic up here warmer than it should be uh, very similar to what we saw overall in 2016 2017 2018 with not a colder Atlantic that's where the similarity ends each season is different in 2017 we had a lot more warmth focused down here uh, last year it took a while for it to get going but we eventually developed a warm MDR um, the bottom line is that the Atlantic is not colder than the long-term average right since about 1981 through 2010 looking at that base state this is what this particular chart indicates that's the anomaly uh, subset you know the data set or whatever Does that makes sense you gotta derive it from somewhere anomalies to what well that's the answer to that uh, and the water temperatures are warmer than average out here near Hawaii and just by a little bit and that could become important in the next few days as well looking at actual sea surface temperatures as I mentioned the Gulf of Mexico always warm enough and then it's just a matter of how much above or below normal is that water profile in fueling uh, hurricanes and last year for Michael those very warm water temperatures extended right up to the coastline there the shelf water even in that first third of October remember Michael made landfall on October 10th and the water temperatures were quite warm even up to that date well looking right now at the end of July it's this area of the Gulf through the Florida Straits and parts of the extreme northern Caribbean there near the Isle of Youth and around the Cayman Islands and vicinity very warm water temperatures uh, 30 31 degrees Celsius and looking at the anomalies those are just a little bit warmer than they should be but a little bit translates into a lot of energy when you're talking about water temperatures and how much upper ocean heat content may lie within the water column looking at the Atlantic the Western Atlantic here zooming in just a little bit um, these are again not anomalies these are the actual sea surface temperatures and we typically look for 26 degrees Celsius which is roughly this line right here I'll kind of follow it around 26 Celsius you see it's been knocked down fairly far to the south here it did make its way up much closer 
to Long Island and off the coast of New Jersey uh, and that area. But since we've had strong, uh, strong cold front, especially for July, come through and the water got mixed up, etc., uh, that 26 Celsius line now farther to the south. But still, water temperatures, I guess, pleasant. A little cold for me. 21, 23 Celsius, whatever, low 70s Fahrenheit. If it's 95 degrees um, up here off of Belmar, and then you go into the Atlantic, I guess that's okay. Or if you're in Fire Island and it's 95 degrees. But you know, if it's 85 and you get in the water and it's chilly, nah, that doesn't work for me. But that's just me. Um, farther to the south, we still have this upwelling continuing to show right along the coast there. It has really nothing to do with hurricanes necessarily, but I think it's an interesting local phenomenon that if you're near the Outer Banks, those water temperatures are on the Outer Banks here. Water temperatures have cooled, uh, owed again to this strong southwesterly wind that we've had, that offshore flow, generally speaking, pushes the water away. We call that upwelling. And that even goes down and holds true for right along the shelf water from Onslow Bay down to the Cape Fear region where water temperatures are only about 79 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. But offshore in the Gulf Stream area, 28, 29 Celsius, uh, low to mid 80s overall. Plenty warm for hurricane activity if something should come along, which for now we're not seeing too much in the way to suggest that that will happen. The vorticity map for this afternoon, a little bit of energy here in the eastern Caribbean associated with very disorganized and probably not going to do anything 95L, invest area 95L. This is Flossie in the eastern Pacific, and if the map extended off more to the west, you would see Eric sitting over here somewhere, but the map doesn't extend that far west on this particular view. So we won't show that, but it's there, trust me. And then more energy off the coast of Africa over here uh, as the tropics try to change their overall look. It's a slow process. Talk about a watched pot never boiling. It seems like we really watch these things, the tropics, very closely these days. And when we anticipate whether or not something will develop, it seems like it takes a long time, doesn't it? Uh, and that's not to say people welcome it. You do need the rainfall. Some of these tropical systems can be, bring beneficial rain. We have seen that through this area here as 95L and its parent tropical wave uh, have moved through, which I actually want to show here. So let me flip these around just a little bit. There we go. So here's a satellite shot. Uh, there's 95L. There's Flossie. There's Eric. Let's take a look at those on the National Hurricane Center chart real quick because those could have some impacts for Hawaii. Again, that's the system for 95L. 10% uh, chance it's not that it's going to, 90% chance it's not going to do anything. 10% chance that it will, uh, basically. In the East Pacific, uh, Eric will pass to the south of Hawaii almost certainly. Before, Not before it becomes a major hurricane, though, so it could send out some swells ahead of it which would reach some of these south and east facing beaches not so much along the north shore of the uh, island chain but the especially the big island the east and south facing beaches would benefit the most from that incoming swell flossy will have to really watch hurricane flossy this is still several well it eventually will become a hurricane several days from being a problem for the hawaiian islands but you know, it's something we really have to watch. And again, it's not just that, oh, it could be a hurricane when it gets there. Very rare. Well, that's true. It is very rare. But we're not just looking for hurricanes. We're looking to see what's going to bring a lot of rain, what could bring in additional rip currents, you know, when we're talking about any system passing by a coastline. There are all kinds of hazards associated with tropical cyclones. And just because something isn't a hurricane doesn't mean that it is not dangerous. If you get bitten by a three foot long rattlesnake, you're still going to be in quite dire straits as you would, even though it would probably be more severe, if you were bitten by a six foot rattlesnake. They're both rattlesnakes and they both cause problems if they bite you. We can all agree on that. So just pointing this out that yes, I know it's hard to get a hurricane into Hawaii, but it's not like they just completely vanish with no impacts. So we have to watch that in the coming days 
Not so much with Eric, even though, again, it might bring some swells as it goes by, maybe a change in wind direction and a few passing showers. But Flossie, the models are indicating a track closer to Hawaii. All right, so moving on over around the globe here, centered on the Atlantic Basin, these great maps, uh, satellite animations from Levi at Tropical Tidbits. This is the system that's uh, 95L, and I'm going to show you something interesting in just a moment associated with it. Really, upper level wind's kind of strong. The pattern over here where it's headed not going to be too favorable overall, so I don't think this is going to do much. You never know, but it's not looking too likely. This tropical wave has some decent model support in a lot of the ensemble members. It's not an overwhelming majority of the ensemble members yet. Remember, you have your operational model, but then you also have these perturbations of that model, what we call the ensemble members, with slightly different variables to give you, in some cases, drastically different outcomes, in some cases. And so what you try to do is to see the overall pattern, and the analogy is it's the equivalent of having, like, you know, a uh, a conductor of an orchestra would be like the operational model, you know, like Hans Zimmer when he's conducting his orchestra for a movie score. Well, he's good and his cello player are real good together. Maybe Hans Zimmer's the European model. Great analogy, because he's European. And uh, the cello player, I'm not sure what nationality. They're probably Asian. I've seen it, so that's how I think I know that, by the way. And so that might be like the JMA model or whatever. And they're both very good, but you put them all together, wow, you hear some incredible music from Hans Zimmer and his orchestra. And the same is true with these operational models. The GFS, the American model, the Canadian model. Um, you know, Celine Dion, Canadian singer. She sings by herself, but backed up with an incredible orchestra or what have you, and it's amazing. So the model ensembles uh, typically give you a better picture and a more end, in tuned, end is not a word, I N E D, <laughs> in tuned picture or in tuned picture of uh, whatever. You see what I'm getting at? It's a better, clearer signal as to what to expect. And uh, some of the ensemble guidance on that long rant there, not a rant, just an explanation, um, trying to develop this. That's the bottom line. It is a signal, though, of what's coming through this area over the next 90 days or so, 60 to 90 days, something like that. Mid-August through mid-October, that makes sense to me. Um, so let's see, what else did I want to show you? Sort of the wider shot here, more energy over Africa as that convectively coupled Kelvin wave energizes the atmosphere, providing convergence, more moisture. This too is also knocking down that Saharan air layer across this region, which we'll start monitoring even more, and you can see that SAL, the Saharan air layer, even right in here, prominent, and these tropical waves kind of ingest that Saharan air, drier mid-level air, warmer air, and warm air over warm water doesn't typically lead to convection. You gotta have, and that's a loft, colder air aloft, you gotta give the warm air, which is buoyant, something to be buoyant into, all right? So back to this shot here, there's 95L, some of the energy passing through portions of the Caribbean, and we caught that on our nest cam that we have down in uh, St. John in the Virgin Islands. This was earlier today. Uh, some rain, much needed rain. Um, our patron, Brent, he is one of our patrons from Patreon, right? And he hosts one of our nest cams on his house down there. This is from St. John earlier today. Um, a few minutes before noon, um, St. John's time, St. John apostrophe S time, because it's St. John, not St. John's. Um, now, remember when I was showing you on the modeling that storm that was headed towards Europe? This is uh, another one of our supporters, Chris, who lives over in the UK. Uh, we know him as Chris H. Uh, posted this radar image to our chat that we have and here's a satellite picture of the storm uh, that was tweeted to me. That is an impressive mid-latitude cyclone, wouldn't you say? It looks like one heck of a cinnamon roll or something like that, or a nautilus almost, if you get away from the food. Um, I don't eat cinnamon rolls anymore, but huh, boy, they used to be good. That That's a really wound up storm uh, heading in towards the coast of France. 
the southwest part of Great Britain over here. Uh, and this is the radar signature again that Chris posted for us on our chat showing some of those bands with this system. Um, it's a mid-latitude storm. Water temperature is not warm enough for it to be purely tropical, but it is potent, that is for sure, and after all of that heat across this area, maybe this could bring some relief to that. Uh, just an interesting look to the whole pattern. All right, well, that is it from me for today and tomorrow. I'm going to be traveling tomorrow, so the next update will be Wednesday morning from Oklahoma, where I am heading to test our weather balloon, the Herbie Project Hurricane Research Balloon. Team and I are getting together out there, myself, Brent, Kerry, and Derek, uh, our Patreon supporters. You will be able to watch all the stuff that we do from the ground live starting Wednesday morning. I'll post on Patreon about that, and that'll be a public post. So later this evening, if you head over to patreon.com slash hurricane track, you can read all about it. It'll be a public post. You don't have to be a paying patron to read that. Uh, but our supporters, this is one of our very first exclusive events, and I'm looking forward to being able to share this with you as we do testing of our very important and very innovative hurricane research balloon project this payload that we want to launch into the stratosphere in the eye of a hurricane one day. We did it during Hurricane Nate. And if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can watch that for free at uh, Amazon. Just search Tracking the Hurricanes 2017, the 2017 version. That's on Amazon Prime, included with Prime. And at the end, yeah, we did. We launched our payload at night during Hurricane Nate as it came into Mississippi. So you really couldn't see much once it got above the low cloud deck of the um, relatively cloud-free eye, just some low clouds and some mist. If you've seen it, our, our documentary on that, you know what I'm talking about. Now we want to do it in the daylight. So we got to go test it and make sure we know what we're doing and we're all set to go in case we have that opportunity this year. You never know. Even a strong tropical storm, that would be really neat to do. We get good data and an amazing video from those GoPro cameras. All right, so my next update, Wednesday from Elk City, Oklahoma. I'll talk to you then. I am Mark Suddeth for HurricaneTrack.com. As always, thanks for tuning in from your device. I appreciate it. And I'll talk to you again from uh, the middle of the country on Wednesday. <laughs>